In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, our righteous judge, daily your mercy surprises us with everlasting forgiveness. Strengthen our hope in you, and grant that all the peoples of the earth may find their glory in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the third chapter of Romans, where Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and it is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. Here ends the reading. Yes, 
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Then Jesus said to the Judeans who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. The happy Reformation Sunday. Reformation Day is tomorrow if you're catching this live and That makes this Sunday a special one in our Lutheran corner of the world because it's the day we acknowledge the Reformation which Luther kicked off. At the same time, here at church in person, we're celebrating something else, confirmation. In this case, the day when people who were baptized at a young age, after some instruction, take the baptismal promises that have been made on their behalf, usually by parents and sponsors, like godparents, And these young people now commit to those promises themselves. It's striking how these two ideas intersect. The Reformation, just like it sounds, reformation, it's taking new form once again. It happens not just in those big historical ways, but in little ways across time and space. Christ's church on earth changes as new people join and or grow up. Whether they grow into particular positions of leadership or not, each will have at least some influence over time. Though there is this continual thread that connects, say, a congregation from its inception to its close, there is this constant state of renewal and reformation throughout its life. And one way it happens is by new young people maturing into their faith. Also, the Reformation changed how we look at confirmation. The Roman Catholic Church regarded, regards it as a sacrament. Lutheranism has a bit of a different definition of a sacrament, but 
nevertheless, it's remained an important practice for us. So changed a little bit, but not too much. And one last observation then on how these concepts intersect. They intersect in that they sometimes feel like they end one thing and begin another. But it's not as it seems. In fact, it's more like marking a continuation along the way. Sometimes confirmation happens, for example, on Pentecost Sunday, but that's near the end of the church year, and it gives the impression that it's like graduation, like you're done now. And unfortunately, all too often, families think of confirmation as one of four things on a to-do list. Go to church to get baptized, or have your own child baptized, get confirmed, get married, and then wait a while, hopefully, and get buried. Just the same, Roman Catholic churches historically, they don't so much anymore, but historically they taught that Lutheranism was a new religion that Martin Luther started, born out of a, a handful of disagreements and heresies that really weren't worth splitting up over. But neither of those impressions is true. Confirmation is marked in worship by the affirmation of baptism, something we do at other times too. It affirms what came before and makes commitments about what is to come. Now, it's an important step in a young person's life in the church, of course, to be sure, but it is just one step along the way in one's faith journey. It's not one of four things to check off. It's one of a thousand things to consider throughout the years. Luther's Reformation, just the same, did not start a new religion, but a new tradition within the larger umbrella. Rest assured that Jesus is a lot less concerned with what divides church from church, denomination from denomination, then we humans are, we give it way too much attention. So a through line that we might acknowledge from those three observations, and the list could have gone on, three observations about how Reformation and Confirmation intersect, is that some things change, other things stay the same, and how, when, and why we make those changes, how do we navigate that reality, that raises all sorts of important questions. We change so that what is most important and cannot change stays secure, but at the same time what ought, maybe even must, change does. Okay, well, let's start with that first bit, and we'll end with the second bit. What must not change? Notice in our reading from John, I used the word Judeans, even though the NRSV up on your screen said Jews. Aside from the fact that that word has just fallen out of favor generally, I opted for a better translation given our context. John was writing by geographic distinction, so that's how I said it. Judean, Galilean, Samaritan. Our current concept of Judaism, if it applies to Judeans, would very much also apply to Galileans, and that includes Jesus and the disciples. If read wrongly, this chapter comes across as an attack on Jewish people, but it is not. The word refers to those people with some political and uh, religious influence, that's how most scholars would see it, uh, and if it is a broader category than that. It just means people who lived in and around that area. Now, for today, we're focused not on those more attacking verses, but on the ones that, are, uh, that acknowledge some of the Judeans did in fact believe, trust in Jesus, and continuing in Jesus' word would set them free. In this gospel, John lets us know that Jesus was, in fact, the incarnate word of God, and therefore his actual words, his literal words, bear the authority of God over all of creation and tap into the order, the logos, by which everything exists. Jesus also told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And here we find a relationship between him, the truth, and freedom. So the order of creation sets out instructions, a way to live life. And following that way leads to freedom. It sounds a bit paradoxical. Be restrained to a particular way of living, one narrow path, and find freedom therein. Well, let's unpack that in light of these quirky ways in which Reformation and Confirmation 
intersect. How things are always changing and yet staying the same. And we need to navigate that with some diligence. Two things again. First, we might ask what we're free from. What is Jesus going to free from? Free us from? But we got to take it a step further, too, and say, what are we free for? Humanity is enslaved to all sorts of idols. We devote ourselves to bad ideas. We idolize imperfect, even evil people. We compromise our ideals, our values for money. We prioritize ourselves in the short term, knowing that it may harm our community or our world in the long term. We enjoy our self-indulgence and let our responsibilities go. We fear death and turn inward. We seek safety. We're tempted by outside forces and not the ones we ought to be listening to. Those are the kind of things that living in the way set by this order can set us free. Those are the things we'd be free from. Maybe Maybe Jesus isn't offering an easy out to all of those situations, like those forces are just gone. But trust in God and confidence in the gospel means that we are freed and called and empowered to live in spite of all those enslavements. We can reject sin, death, and the devil and all those forces which rebel against God. We can live as though we are invincible, immortal, and forgiven, even though it doesn't seem that way, even though it's not that, according to all these outside forces, but that's just the truth. The truth is that's what we are, invincible, immortal, and forgiven. Second half of that, then, what are we free for? Why would Jesus offer this at all? Well, that's part of that idea of it being a way. How we live in light of this order of creation, and it's what Jesus calls us to again and again. Most simply, love God and love neighbor. Give of yourself as much as you can and then give some more because it turns out you can. Now, what does that look like exactly? We've looked at this all summer long and into the fall. For Jesus' disciples and followers then, it meant literally risking their very lives, their livelihoods, their reputations, their resources, everything else you can think of. They risked it all to make sure the gospel was heard far and wide. But what does it mean for us? That doesn't usually happen to us. Well, that's the second thing to consider this morning, a question with no simple answer. What do we do with the truth? But the answer goes something like this. The principles of our faith are anchored, they're built in, the bedrock of creation. The ideas, the ideals, order, word, pathways, truth, freedom are all caked in to the way creation works. And that doesn't change. Those things don't change. Yet times change, places change, people change, the church changes. We celebrate some changes while warning against others and learning from others still. You've heard it said that The truth is like an elephant being examined by a host of blind men. One feels the side of the elephant and reckons it's a wall. Another feels a leg and reckons the truth is a tree. And another still thinks the tail is a snake and on it goes. That's a great illustration for differences of opinion and how we can only see so much and on and on. But the truth, as we're talking about it, well... It's a bit better, a little better illustration would be to think of it like genetic code. It's caked in from the very start, even if you don't see it, even if you don't know about it. And it sets its system in order, in this case an organism, in the case of the logos and truth, all of creation. So, that's not the end of the story though, right? Genetics gets the organism started, but there's plenty more to talk about, lots more to talk about. Two identical twins separated at birth. There's been studies on this. They'll have uncanny similarities as they grow older, often appreciating things like the same music and seeking out very similar life partners. Yet other aspects of their lives can and will be quite different. The genetics are the same. They definitely have their influence, but it doesn't always manifest in exactly the same way. Now, most of us aren't twins, of course, so here's a remarkably specific example of genetics made manifest. This can be much smaller than something like 
having a twin. There's these little things called PTC strips. PTC is short for an artificial chemical name that's quite similar to a natural chemical found in things like uh, broccoli or Brussels sprouts. Now, it turns out, they put this chemical on paper, and some people can taste it. They can taste the PTC strips, and they're quite bitter. But some people don't taste it at all. It's just paper. You probably will go your whole life without tasting one. Yet, if ever given the chance, your genetics would manifest in that way. It's very small, but you would find whether it's bitter or not to you. You may or may not explain, or excuse me, that idea may or may not explain why some people love certain bitter foods and others hate them, like those leafy greens. The underlying principle for each person remains the same, but whether it's relevant and how it affects you just depends on other things. What kind of foods are even available to you to know? Where do you live and work? and so on. Now, that's how something caked into an individual is made manifest over time based on their circumstances. The truth is kind of like that, following from the logos, the order of creation. Only we're not talking about individuals anymore. Now we're talking about everything. It's not that there's, it's not that there's one universal set of do's and do nots that cover every possible group of people or persons and, and situations. And if you don't cross all those T's and dot all those I's, God's going to condemn you. That would be righteousness prescribed by a law of works, which, as we just heard from Paul, simply is not how it goes. No, instead, it's that God calls you to have faith, have this trusting relationship with God, then to love God. And in that, commands you to love your neighbors. And what that looks like for you may not be the same as it is for me. And it won't be the same as it was for first century Judeans, 16th century Europeans, or even Christians today on the other side of the world. So confirmation, affirmation of baptism, reformation of the church, something changes our circumstances. The bedrock of creation, the word which became incarnate, never changes. The question for all of you then, and especially for our confirmands, given our world today as it is now, what should the church look like as it reforms around your influence? What should this congregation do? How are you going to put the truth into action in your life? It's the exact same truth that it's always been, but it won't manifest exactly the same for you. So what is the new thing God is doing in this new age? Look deep within yourself. Take a serious look at the world around you. Consider that which is eternal and cannot change. In this deeply divided nation, in uncertain times, with disease, war, and economic hardship knocking at the door on and off, how are you going to love God and love neighbor in old ways, but also new ones? Figure that out. And then in and through the church, we will teach each other and make each other's love, motivated by that truth, that much more manifest. We will take what has been caked in and put it into action here and now. So help us, God. Amen.
together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. God, our fortress, we pray for the church. Write your law of love on the hearts of your people, that we remain steadfast in our witness to your grace, Lord, in your mercy. God, our liberator, we pray for your earth, bring new life to overused land and contaminated rivers, reform and reorient our relationship with the environment that we faithfully care for creation. Lord, in your mercy. God, our refuge and strength, we pray for the nations where they are in uproar. Bring wise leadership and comfort to those in distress. Make wars to cease and peace to enter every land and be with those who may be in harm's way as they seek to bring an end to war and to bring about peace. We pray especially for sons and daughters of this place now enlisted, as well as missionaries in faraway lands. Lord, in your mercy. God, our very present help in trouble, we pray for those in need. Show mercy to refugees and all fleeing from danger. Shelter any without homes. Calm all who are facing illness, surgery, or a new diagnosis. We pray especially for those whose needs are immediate and ongoing, immediate and urgent. We pray for all those on our prayer list and all those who rest heavy on our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy. God, our Redeemer, we pray for our congregation. Bless all who are preparing for baptism and all those who today affirm their baptism. Open their hearts to your Holy Spirit, teach them your word, and give them courage to proclaim their faith. Lord, in your mercy. 
God, our stronghold, we give thanks for those who have gone before us in faith, especially Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, and all the reformers. Renew and reform us as we strive to continue in your word, Lord, in your mercy. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and our silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. As you take a moment to share a greeting, blessing, or word of peace, by any means you should so choose. Just reading the tagline there that I usually don't. I will remind you that as we pray together, we're praying over gifts given and received in any venue. So with that, let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God.